All right, welcome to another episode of Convention Tea. Um, we are your hosts, Dame Scarlett Asnable and Jared the Greek. And you can see our uh, brand new avatar is here, um, done by artist Mirasol. They made like these uh, anime esque avatars of us for Convention Tea, and we just love their work. And pretty soon we'll have them also do commissions for um, our other hosts, such as our um, East Coast correspondent, Alice and our other correspondent um rams we're actually gonna talk about a little bit talk about a little about rams here because he actually made a cameo at la comic-con but stick around to find out where that cameo is okay let's kind of get this uh get this started so how long have we been attending la comic-con or stanley's kamikaze or kamikaze or comic-con la or any number of other names it's had since the first year yeah, we went during year one when it was just like Kensha Hall. Um, it was just basically a huge uh, part of the parking structure, dealer's tables, and that was pretty much about it. Was that the year where we all went from uh, Torchwood? Yes, that was that the year. That was we... awesome. Yes, it was that year. That was a lot of fun. I never, it's the only time I've ever had like a full group of like, it's from the same thing. I mean, yes, technically I've been in part of JoJo groups, but we weren't all from the same timeline, so it was annoying. <laughs> like all, all all sorts of timeline mix-ups I and mean, like fine fighting game exists but i like having everyone from the same show same time period uh, and that's all the rare times I did that's also where i picked up some stuff i think it may have been when i first met lloyd kaufman which was great or maybe the second year when i met lloyd kaufman i think first year he wasn't there but they did have a trauma booth and i grabbed a bunch of stuff i needed to replace because all my vhs tapes magically disappeared uh big sad all right, let's get this uh, presentation That's started. why I have like three copies of Toxie on DVD or Blu-ray. <laughs> Thanks, Lloyd. All right, let me just uh, fix up. We have a bit of a technical difficulty here, but it's nothing that we can't fix. So, um, Jay, tell us a little bit more about, um, what was one of your favorite LA Comic Cons? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I know one year it was I think it was when you were off in Boston. It was just me rolling it solo, more or less. I, I think I'm Miguel there. And we ended up getting a bunch of interviews and stuff like that because it was just still at the smaller stages. I don't even think Stan Lee had owned it yet. But I think it had gone to that point of being called Kamikaze to either LA Kamikaze or LA Comic Con. I'm not quite sure what the name was at the time, but I remember getting some good interviews in there and having kind of a fun one. I believe that was the convention whose report was done to a limelight by Rush. So I used YYZ for uh, um, the interview section. Oh, it was great. And uh, that might have been one of the most, most best ones. It was just fun wandering around, meeting like people, talking to people. And it was still chill and still kind of small. You know, they still had that big stage in the middle of the dealer hall. But, you know very limited stuff beyond that but the dealer hall was large enough that you you know had things to do hell they even had like people playing quidditch like it was weird yeah it sounds like it's like a huge free-for-all thing and this was like back in what 2012 2013 uh, yeah, 13 around there yeah so the, the show's been around for about 10 years thereabouts maybe a little more and it the early days were a lot more just like wild and crazy and now it feels more like a regular con i kind of miss the older days yeah, I really like those Wild West days of, like, uh, pop culture conventions in the early uh, 2010s. Where they're just like, we're going to throw a little bit of everything here. Here's here's some people playing Quidditch. Here's some people doing uh, LARPing. Here's here's uh, toy booths. Here's comic co comic book booths. Here's a bunch of indie artists. And here's, here's, like, some writers. It was just, here's some wrestlers. It was just everything. And I kind of... I kind of prefer that that way. This year kind of started to feel like that again. You got a little bit of that little little bit of everything mixed into a bowl feeling this year, I think. All right. Before we go any further, we want to let you know that Convention Tea is brought to you by Yemac Sweaters. If you use our code yemac dame asmal you can get 40% off your total purchase at Yemac Sweater. Yemac is like my favorite place to get cardigans, cozy wear. So I highly recommend supporting this company. And you can get 40% off your total purchase if you use our code yemac dame asmal 
All right, so if this is your first time tuning into an episode of Convention Tea, a really brief history of Scarlet Rhapsody. This was started in my dorm room back in the early 2000s. I just wanted to talk about conventions. I just wanted to talk about uh, my personal experience at um, anime conventions when I was living up in the Bay Area. It started as a website. I just started like just posting um, like blog style entries, journal style entries about like, did I like the convention? What did, what didn't I like about it? Who would I recommend it to? And I would just take p pictures of cosplayers um, in the hallways, just to kind of document um, the evolution of fandom. So our website, Scarlet Rhapsody, has a huge archive of convention culture since the early 2000s. So if you wanted to explore more, what was it like for Anime Expo in 2005 at the Anaheim Convention Center? We got that on our website. Convention T is just an evolution of what we've been doing. So we're using our uh, video platform here on YouTube and Twitch to tell you what our experience was like. All right, so that is not what Okay, all right, let's just talk about um, LA Comic Con um, 2022. Um, attendees, um, according to the press release, was around 120,000 people. Um, Jared, did it feel like that? I think that's counting each day as its individual thing. I remember, I think if you ended up all three days, you probably would achieve that number, but I don't think they were all there at once. Yeah, it didn't really feel like um, 120,000 people. Like, we've been to that convention center during during Anime Expo, and you can really feel like the convention center bursting at the seams where you just want to hide at the JW Marriott, like in the panel room the whole time. It's like, uh, the LA Convention Center scares me, crowds. Um, but it didn't really feel like 120,000 people. It felt like it was more like turnstile in and out numbers mm -hmm. than it really was like total. But um, Saturday was uh, definitely um, crowded. It was busy, but it wasn't a hundred and some thousand people. It's busy. not like Anime Expo crowded where like you're just packed in sardines. Um, you can definitely feel the crowd. You can definitely like, yeah, there are a lot of people here. And I know sometimes like you and I kind of have to like just go to our usual, usual hidey holds in the LA uh, Convention Center just to like have lunch and just kind of like um, take a people breather. Uh -huh. But... It was much more manageable than, say, an anime expo. For sure. Um, LA Comic Con, um, we were, this is a convention because it's so local. We usually decide three weeks before the convention if we're gonna do it. And it usually depends on our energy levels because we've been doing a couple of conventions prior to LA Comic Con in the fall season. We did PMX, we did AX Chibi, we did, well, I did Anime Pasadena. And like, okay, th three conventions in a row, I'm like, okay, um, fourth convention for the uh, um, fall season, do we really wanna do it? Like, yeah, okay, let's just, let's do it. We have nothing better to do. It gives an excuse, like, just dress fancy. As you see here, we are dressed up from Spy X Family as Lloyd and your and your. We've stumbled across a lot of Spy X Family stuff there, which I was kind of surprised. And I'm just very happy to like represent anime at a Comic Con type setting because Spy X Family, it's just been like my favorite thing this year that sparks a lot of joy. And I am very hyped for season two coming out in 2023 and the movie. Let's hope it's not a synoptic movie because I hope it's like its own adventure. <laughs> Barely any story. It's not going to be a synoptic movie. It's going to be like, we got to take a vacation to England and we're going to go see our Uncle Sean. Yeah, Uncle Sean or something. That's what's going to be. And our other uncle, Pierce. Oh, and crazy old Uncle Timothy. And then some sort of crazy adventures are going to happen. With Uncle Roger, who has a lot of puns and likes to ski. Well, who doesn't? I, I got nothing for um, Uncle George, unfortunately. Mm. Well, he got married once, but his wife died. <laughs> Didn't work out well. The point is, it'll be something like that. And that'll be fun. They'll, they'll do the same thing they do with, like, Love Life movies. We're going to go to another country for reasons, sing some songs, and then at the end, everyone's had a valuable lesson about the real vacation was the friends they made along the way. And we don't talk about Uncle Daniel. Mm-hmm. All right, so when it, this is a section where we talk about popular fandoms, but... Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> but first, this will shock you, mm. um, Jared. Mm. The most popular cosplay... I saw at um, LA Comic-Con was actually Daredevil. 
of course, I've seen like a lot of folks dress up as true. a. No, let me show you. I have photo proof here. I saw a lot of people like do the suit version of Matt Murdock, you know, the Greg suit, Kane type thing. Mm -hmm. But I lost, saw a lot of people do different variants of Matt, and it was like the most like popular thing I saw at the convention. So I saw like me, not one, but two people do the I'm not Daredevil. I'm sure you have this gentleman here with a candy cane mm -hmm. um, for the cane. And That's then you have. Um, Electra, and you also have um, Daredevil from the uh, TV series, the uh, black outfit. The, uh, yeah, the hand wraps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know this fandom more than I do. Yes. I like the season one first half outfit. I actually think when they finally gave him his proper, the red outfit, it actually looked really good, and I was relieved because I was always afraid that would look stupid. But thank God they gave him the dumb gold one in She-Hulk, so that's great. Thanks. And we also have the uh, what the Filipinos refer to as the Jufron version of the outfit, which is the yellow and the uh, red outfit here. Yeah, the version I hate. Yeah. But no, this kid here, like, he did a good job. I, don't I like this guy. <laughs> it still looks terrible. I don't know. I think this guy did a good job representing this uh, variation here. Do you know what the running joke has always been with the gold and red outfit? Tis. That's... That's the kind of costume that'd be chosen by a blind guy. And it's been the running joke since the 70s when he was invented. And the alpha here, the coloration, um, Jufron, for those of you who don't know, it's like a Filipino like banana sauce type thing. And the running joke with the Filipinos is like, yeah, the uh, yellow and um, red outfit um, looks like a Jufron bottle. You can Google it, but I know I... Out of like all the characters, out of all the variants of like of a single character, um, Daredevil was like the most one I've seen uh, at um, LA Comic Con. Because as I'm trying to do my brain thing, I'm like, I didn't see a lot of DC people. I saw my, I saw a fair share of Batman. Um, you do see a lot of Batman. I saw, but I, but like our Harley Quinns have dropped dramatically in number. Yeah, Harley um, Quinn was a thing back in 2017. Yeah, but um, Harley Quinn was insane when like Harley, Harley Quinn was popular. Who knows what might happen when Gaga takes the reins as Harley Quinn in Joker 2, because I'm actually curious about what her outfits are going to look like, because I'm a Gaga fan, and I know it's going to have a badass soundtrack. Other fandoms I've seen at this... I What I like about LA Comic Con is there's a variety of different fandoms, yes, and people are. are coming from like different... like parts of fandom so a couple to, doctors. to like just converge mm -hmm. here. So of course I have to mention Spy X Family, not because we were costuming for it, but I did see a lot of kiddos dressed up like Anya, Becky, and Damien. Yes, which was which was adorable. And because you and I were walking at, along as uh, Lloyd and your forger, we had like a lot of kiddos like, oh my God, like it's mom and dad. Like, yeah, let's, let's mm -hmm. all take a photo. That's awesome. And then I also saw people from the horror fandom. So you have my buddy here, Kitty, um, dressed up as... Her interpretation of Pennywise. There was also a horror convention going on in Pasadena that same weekend, so she did back to back LA Comic Con one day, <laughs> and then like a hor a, a Christmas horror theme convention in Pasadena. I would totally go to that. It has garbage. The garbage day guy was one of the um, guests. He has a name. I forgot his name. Like you're. This is that's more your territory. That's more your world than mine. Yes. Um. I think that'd be a lot of fun because. I don't even know what I'd wear. I think I just want to go and like just have the fun of the Christmas plus the macabre. Um, but we'll have to try it like oh when God, the Midsummer like, Night's so events. many freaking um, people going as Silent Night, Deadly Night. Any, any either of the brothers? Not photoed here. I actually did see someone cosplay as a Krampus running around the convention. Nice. And also you have see here you have Ric Flair, and towards the end of day two, you and I were just kind of walking around, and there's like a woo. Thing going on like a Ric Flair chant. and his friends were running around just wooing and people were like joining them it was it was insane it was it was a lot of fun so i what i like about la comic-con is like there's no fandom that's like trying to clip oh, that was eclipsing one and the other because yeah, that's why it was hard for me to think of like what was the most popular thing because like normally like when i do these things okay demon slayer genshin spikes oh yeah it's and so forth like and moving on still next slide Demon Slayer's there, I saw. Even I thought about, oh. even we thought about going as Demon Slayer, Slayer and I thought about Day being Beidou, because I, I got Beidou in the mail that week, and I was like, ah, I can be a pirate. Yeah, arr, yar. But no, I'm going to say Beidou for Anime Los Angeles, because they have like that uh, harbor view, and like, yeah. Just realized something, if I cosplayed from Crossbones Gundam, I'd spend my entire time going, yar. They don't even say that, I just, it's what I would do. You just need, like, Crossbones, like, um, flair to just kind of, like, represent Crossbones because F91 is amazing and all of you should, um, well, Sunrise should make the series. Sunrise, yes, should remake F91 properly. 
But <laughs> I just have a soft spot for the movie because I was like the one of the things that got me back into Gundam after like being a wing fan girl for so long. Like, hey, this looks cool. Like, Jay, what is this? Well, the good news is you don't have to know any continuity because it jumps ahead like several years after Shars Counter to twenty thirty years. I think it's thirty years after Shars Counter Attack. Yeah, ninety three to. 123 so yes 30 years later so it's designed to almost it was supposed to be kind of a semi soft reboot and then they ran out of funding and this, this we had a little movie made out of the first probably 12 episodes maybe first 20 episodes <laughs> all right let's just talk about like our adventures to uh LA Comic Con. So we didn't do Friday because Friday is usually okay. The convention center opens at five o'clock. Also, work exists. It works exists. I don't want to go to downtown LA at freaking five o'clock in the evening. No, nope. thank you. Nope. Not from Orange County. I think the only time we've ever done that is I think you were doing uh, the fashion show. The fashion show thing. But the convention opened up like at 12, 12 noon. That was the year where I could have grabbed uh, the a cross, not the crossbones. Um, one of the Gundam experience and I didn't and I was like I'll just see it no one's gonna grab this no one cares about this series I'll come back for it later next day I've covered a gun and I'm like of course it is why did I do that yeah so um the year I did the fashion show the convention opened up like at 12 noon like we were able to like okay we can leave at 11 o'clock uh, a.m no problem like just get there um I had the fashion show and then you y'all did your own thing mm -hmm. But this time around, like, when they do their three-day weekend, like, Friday, day one, it's more like a uh, glorified preview night where you pick it up really, your badge really just feel like and that. you just kind of, like, just shop in the dealer's hall. But again, if you want to shop in the dealer's hall with almost no, you know, competition and everyone has fresh stock, it's the time to do it. I actually really, certain conventions, I actually really enjoyed preview night because it's where I would do all my shopping initially. And then I have those maybe things, which would be last day of con, if they're, especially if they're on discount. Or if I'm like, oh, I didn't spend that much at the con. I have extra money, so I'm grabbing this or that. So here's a photo from day two. It's the first photo I took, because every time I go to conventions, I always do, like, the first photo of us in line, just us trying to get our badge, and just kind of get, like, a um, a first vibe check. So um, you and I, we decided to take a lift um, to the convention, because you can see that there's <laughs> this mess on Pico Boulevard. That's where you see the lion cars here trying to get parking i tr out of curiosity i tried to ask like, the parking attendants like what time the lot was already full um they, i don't think they quite understood my question i was trying to put it in context like hi i'm press i just want to know like what time the lot was full it's just yeah just then, my reference and then they agreed with you yes the lot is full <laughs> like no i i, mean, I, I need information i need data did it fill up like how how quickly do i need to get here tomorrow the lot is full okay moving on <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, like this is like we got there at 10 a.m. and it was already crazy just trying to get a parking spot. And you know, thank goodness we got Lyft. And even though Sunday is a lighter day, we decided to like you know it. Let's just take Lyft instead, just to kind of like just ease, e just kind of like just ease the convenience. The, the value of driving your own car is if you are gonna go and do a lot of shopping, you can just put it directly into your car. The value of taking a rideshare is that you don't have to worry about parking because you're not guaranteed to get the convention center parking unless you get there really early. So uh, just always keep that in mind of this con. And actually keep that in mind of Expo as well because same convention center, same problems. Yeah, Expo, we used to be commuters for Expo, but I think like after like a couple years ago, like we just said like, you know, let's just get a room. Because sometimes at Expo, I'll see like with the parking, um, they'll upcharge up to about $60. I'm like, no, thank you. I'm just going to um, stay at the Biltmore and either take the shuttle or the lift to get to the convention center. Or just to get dropped off directly at JW Marriott because I think that's just a better yes. way to just um, get in, in and out of the LA Convention Center. Because there is some like confusion like what the LA Convention Center needs is they need to create like a rideshare drop-off zone. That would be nice. Because there's a lot of confusion for Lyft drivers, like, where should I drop you off? And, like, I've even talked to parents um, who, like, drop their kids off at conventions. Like, what's the best place for pickup and drop off? Like, oh, they could just go to the JW Marriott, but I don't want my kids walking all that way. Like, okay, there needs to be, like, a better, like, pickup and drop off zone um, at the LA Convention Center. But that's, that's more on the LA Convention Center's part than it really is on LA Comic Con's part. All right, so day two, um, we, one of the first places we decided to like wander around is West Hall. Um, West Hall, it smelled of cotton candy, much like Anime Expo. And this is also, I no, I, 
No, Wild Bill's, that was over in South Hall. Oh, it's over in South Hall. Because I remember, like, overhearing, like, a couple of folks talking about, like, just how much they jacked up the prices. Yeah, Wild for Bill's is Wild one, Bill. went from being one of the best values at a con to one of the worst values at a con. It's like, no, thank you. <laughs> like, I'm so, I'm happy that we got our Wild Bill's exclusive, like, mugs. Like, I, I could always just use those for Beidou Cosways. Yeah. But I just don't know if I could, like, um do Wild Bill's again at, at conventions because the, pri- the pricing for, like, um the free soda well it's the mug plus the free soda has gone up to i believe 60 dollars. yeah 60 dollars. i rather just take a thermos like, with me and just like fill up a water and just like have and just like have some iced tea in there just although get i think a tea if bag you already there. have the mug you can probably get the uh the disc no just, you have to buy the mug to get at the, the uh, event okay never because mind. you have to, because your mug has to kind of have the special dealy on it well i know they'll put the dealy on it my point is that they'll put a you could get a discount on the dealy uh, for the unlimited, but maybe not. I don't know. Um, but when they get the price up that high, it kind of ruins the fun of Wild Bill. Because 20 to me was reasonable, but like, okay, when you jack it up to 60, I'm like, no, thank you. Even 30 would have been fine. But 60 is a bit. I'm not going to drink that much soda in the course of a day to make that worth it. Oh, ditto. All right, day two. So um, we went to the anime zone. This is part of West Hall. And they had like a lot of inflatable like anime characters here. And also Godzilla. So you have a giant inflatable Pikachu. You had the giant inflatable All Might. And then you also had um, giant, the giant Godzilla here. And they also had like anime photo zones where you can like take uh, photos on, like, on their selfie walls. So they had like this... It was like... I, I felt like it was, it was like very like um, kid friendly. Yes. Yeah, like just take photos here. Just, like take photos there. I believe it was Anime Pasadena that was like um, hosting and sponsoring the site because that is very likely the same Pikachu that is in front of the Pasadena Convention Center during Anime Pasadena. And the uh, backgrounds for photos look mighty familiar too because like, oh yeah, those backgrounds were in um, the other the uh, music hall, the Dragon Ball Dragon Hall, Dragon Hall Z, um, at Anime Pasadena. Mm-hmm. Um, awkwardly placed in the anime zone was a military recruitment zone. Mm-hmm. No, they're not recruiting for uh, Zeon. No, they're actually recruiting for actual like U.S. Army. Army. I've, I've been to booths like that. I think they've come to uh, this con multiple times. It's a weird one one to have in there, but it. It'd be a little cooler if they're all dressed up like G.I. Joe characters, I think. If this is the anime zone, like, if... I think it would like, be a great opportunity for, like... um, What was that gun game, game that was there, like, um, at Anime Expo? I forgot I forgot the game. It was, like, that Gundam shooter game that they were promoting. Oh, um... Gundam Evolution? Evolution, yeah. Yeah, if they had, like, a Gundam Evolution and they, like, set up a, as, like, a recruiting um base for, like, um the Earth, Earth Federation forces. Like, yeah, join join Earth Federation forces, uh, forces, get like a dog tag type thing. And um, if you sample out our game, I think I'd be more okay with that. But it just kind of felt awkward, like seeing like in the max smack dab, dab middle of anime town here, you had a military it's recruitment It's place zone. to put it because it's not where exactly where I would think to put it. It's not really the demographic for that. But I have seen the army dudes at cons before, and I always thought it was kind of cool when they show up, just because I'm like, oh, that's a smart place to kind of recruit people. Um, I think there's, you know, you got to try to flare your booth up a bit with military themes. No, they should, like, do, like, the Attack and Titan aesthetic to it. Well, like I said, if you're going to be in the anime zone, there's plenty of military-themed anime you could kind of, you know, flare up a bit with. Or if you're, you know... No. In, like, a video game Actually, area? There's plenty of video games you can I think they should in the dealer's hall area or the south hall area. And they should lean in more into Starship Troopers. Because, remember, the LA Convention Center was used as, like, the academy in Starship Troopers. It's used as, this, yeah, in a lot of futuristic stuffs. Although, I believe it was, what was it, the Anaheim Convention Center or Starfleet? Yes. Yeah, so. But, yeah. I, I don't know. I have no problem with them being there. I think it's kind of an odd location to put them is the only issue. And I think if you, you know, Deck yourself out as G.I. Joe or any number of anime worlds. I think we're cool. Also, I love the idea of Bandai, listen to this. You've got to do the Earth Federation booth where you have the games and if you play the game, you can get an Earth Federation dog tag or something. Or you have one side of the booth is Earth Federation and one side of the booth is Xeon and you just see who gets more, what's, which, which side is more popular. And Anime Pasadena, if you're listening into this right now, um, please have an inflatable Wing Zero um, as your next inflatable thing. I know you were talking about having an inflatable Pochita. Pochita is cute and all, but I want to see an inflatable Wing Zero. Please. That might be way more complicated just because of how it's designed. We can make it happen. 
Let, let's make an inflatable wing zero happen. I, I want that to happen. But that's just me wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. Also, um, West Hall um, also had a lot of your video games. It had a lot of your electronic gaming. And you also had like a lot of people who are streamers and people who are doing like a lot of live tournaments as seen here. And you also had people like selling card games and also people showing off indie games. I just wish there was a section. Again, this is one of our critiques from last year where we could like, I wanted to try out more of the card games. I really like going to like the tabletop rooms to like demo like new card games. They used to have a great tabletop room. This is where we would do uh, Adventure League stuff. This is where I first got to debut Parth, I believe. Yeah, that was where you created your Parth character for your tabletop characters. And I kind of miss um, LA Comic Con like having a tabletop room because I actually do want to sample because there was this guy who was just like talking about like this. Um, original card game you made and I was very into it and I'm like I want to try play playing this I, I wouldn't mind like playing playing a few rounds yeah, if I have some nice downtime. Yeah it would have nice to have the chance to play because I was really tempted to grab it but I wanted to make sure it was kind of a fun kind of thing because even he was talking about how he did kind of closer to my design thing for some of the games I've worked on which is he had kids who couldn't really read but understood what the cards meant and therefore could play and as a visually impaired person sometimes I can't read flavor test text but if I know what that card is and what it does I can play it and be able to you know progress in a game so it's like with magic the gathering i had to memorize what every card did but once i had it memorized like axel then i was able to uh commit it to memory pretty damn well all right so that was mainly a uh, west hall we only went to west hall once because um well, it'd been nice to kind of explore to some like um, the game, the other games, like some of the indie games there. Like most of our time was spent in panel rooms and over in South Hall, because LA Comic Con. This is also our Christmas shopping con. It really is. So day two, this is like as crowded as South Hall got, and this was South Hall like when they had like um the core dance crew just kind of like do like this dance routine like in the middle of South Hall and you, you can see here a crowd like just uh, lining up um, getting ready to see them. Also day two just some other cosplayers here just kind of show you the variety of fandom. So my buddy here from Las Vegas in the center um, she is cosplaying as um, King Boo from um, Mario in the Lolita style outfit. You have um, New Ichigo from Tokyo Mew Mew, and you also have Geralt from um, Witcher over here. All right, let's talk panels. Um, we did a couple panels on day two, and let's focus on the two that we did in the morning, which was like the indie panel one, and also um, we got a sneak peek at a documentary. Yeah, uh, the indie panel one was really fun just because, one, indie film is kind of having another... Looks like it's right on the verge of a new renaissance, like they had in the early 90s, which gave us a lot of great directors and Kevin Smith. Um, so we could potentially, out of you know the 2020s, maybe get some new great directors and you know a guy who cries on cue. And that could be cool. So it's interesting hearing that, hearing uh, Chris Gore, you know him from G4 TV, you'd know him from DVD uh, Film Threats, Magazine, and a hundred different little shows he's been on as the film reviewer guy they need and his own he's still his film threat still around and it was really cool hearing him talk about the stuff and showing off a few trailers and showing just you know the, the creative directions people are, are going right now while it feels like hollywood is just kind of running in place i really like the one trailer it was about artificial intelligence and the full documentary is actually on YouTube and coincidentally the very morning of day two I was like reading all the discourse that's going on with AI art and some of the controversial apps that's uh that are being popularized by AI art and I'm watching this trailer for a documentary about artificial intelligence and I'm like whoa like is this a documentary or is this is this like a documentary or is this like you know, like, it was like, at that uncanny valley. It's like, wait, is this reality or is this fiction? So I actually do want to see that. It's not, it, it doesn't cost too much on YouTube to rent. Um, the, name of the, the name of the documentary is, like, is just kind of, like, escaping my mind. But I know it's, like, it came out 2021. Um, the name of the title does have AI in the uh, title, and I am really curious to see it, especially with the ongoing AI art discourse going on. Okay, and you um, had a sneak sneak peek. 
Yeah, I, at I, something. I got to get a sneak peek of Attack of the Dock. I'm my... We got to see our friend Rams in um <laughs> in that. He's like he's as it is like I'm a Comic Con and like oh my god it's my cousin. Yeah, he's he's in the. Uh... They, they took one of the commercials they had, which featured friend of the show and contributor, uh, Rams, uh, doing the whole, I'm at Comic-Con. You want to say that again? I'm at comic <laughs> Screaming it. And, uh, which is always blows me in mind, because I probably saw that commercial well before I ever knew the guy. So <laughs> it's just one of those, oh, that's, that was, I remember that commercial. It's like, yeah, you know that person. And I'm like, oh, cool. A lot of my first glimpses of Comic-Con was actually from um, G4. I, I honestly never really watched uh, G4 because I was a really busy college student, and um, we all didn't really have access to cable with the dorm that yeah, I, imagine. I was living in. And a lot of times um, the TV was like dominated um, by my roommates. And anytime I saw G4 was just on a friend's TV or it was like summer, like when I'm at my parents' house and they would do their Comic-Con coverage. Like, oh, hey, this actually looks like a cool event I want to try to go to one of these days. I mean, granted, yes, I've gone to Comic-Con prior to their Comic-Con coverage, but it was like back when Comic-Con was more of like the dealer's hall and just a couple panels. It was more, it was not so much media focused. But when G4 um, covered Comic-Con, I was like, oh, hey, like, I kind of want to go back again. Yeah, and they got a lot of good guests back in the day, too, because they were around anyways, and now they can talk about their movie on, on national TV. Yeah, and it looks like the release is going to be happening April of next year, April 2023, and it looks like they're going to be having a um, release Blu-ray event over in Pasadena, and I'm actually um, looking forward to attending that event. Yeah, I want to see the final version, and the just the hints at the extras is enough to make me want the blu-ray because i'm like oh yes need i granted um g4 wasn't i don't really have a lot of emotional attachment to g4 like i know you have more of an attachment oh yeah to g4 but i just really like a lot of the heart that was put into this documentary as someone coming from the outside looking in yeah it was it was definitely really great you know um i don't i want to keep myself from doing a full review until i have the you know blu-ray in my hands and i'm watching through it and i can make more thorough notes but I am doing a, uh, I guess, what was the term for it? The um, sneak peek, and in, initial impressions kind of thing. Um, just to just briefly talk about it a bit and more about the emotional side of, of the whole G four thing because it, it it's a huge chunk of my post adolescence that I think G four helped really inform, and I felt way too many emotions going through that documentary, <laughs> both both good and bad, uh, because. For anyone who knows the history of G4, I was a tech TV person. So, that. <laughs> and anything else you want to know about will be in my video. All right. All right, day two, we did some exploration of the dealer's hall. So, a couple unique things here at the dealer's hall. There was, like, a Lego display of um, various pop culture icons here. Um, not photoed here, but there was actually a replica of Maleficent's castle, which looked amazing. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I kind of want this, but... I just like admiring just like a lot of the Lego structures that fans have creative created from the ground up. It's like, oh my god, like I I just love all this. I just love seeing all of them. Also, again, this is just us with uh, Anya Kostler who wanted a photo with us because yeah, Kostling as Yor and Lloyd will get attention from Anya Kostlers. Mm -hmm. They also had the star cars out there, too. Um, it oh, also, I completely missed those. Yeah, um, I decided to just, uh, just to take a look at them. I think you were, like, panel hopping or just, like, exploring around. And here we have, like, um, the DeLorean from Back to the Future. Uh, my friend um, who has the Lightning McQueen car, he didn't um, bring his cars to LA Comic Con. But the one that I remember the most is, yeah, of course, the DeLorean. No, the one's always popular. Mm -hmm. Um, also, Loungefly, they um, had, like, their uh, setup there, too. And they had a lot of holiday-themed, like, Disney Christmas backpacks and whatnot. Um, one that stood out to me was the Marie purse and the Marie backpack, which I'm like, okay, I need to, like, just hold off on spending here. I mean, I love Loungefly. Um, please make me a influencer for you, y'all, because I could use a new wallet. I could use a backpack. <laughs> um, I'll definitely show y'all off. Um... But I think one of my favorite things stopping by the lounge fly booth is the, the Marie set they have here. They also have like a Cinderella set where it's like the mice like working on the uh, initial pink dress. Oh. 
and like, oh, I thought that was cute. And they also had a, a Walt version of it too. But we all know what happens to the pink dress. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and another panel that um, we checked out was the Why Movies Suck panel. Jay, briefly describe this panel. So this was interesting. It had a bunch of YouTubers and, of course, Chris Gore and um, Ellen Ng from uh, Screen Rant. Not Screen Rant. From Film from Threat. Film Threat. Um, talking about just kind of the current state of movies. And, you know, it, it, go in, it went into a lot of things. Talking about, you know, the corporatization, it, the fact that no one wants to take a risk anymore, that everyone's putting all their eggs into these, you know, movies that need to make a billion dollars or they're not profitable basket. And how, like, the indie side of things died and, you know, how... Just how, like, Changing franchises the, are the taking over and kind of, like, how Marvel um, has been kind of, like, the end-all, be-all to define modern cinema. Yeah, and how everyone is trying to do that instead of doing what they used to do, which, for anyone who might be too young to remember this, back in the day, you'd have one, maybe two of your big blockbuster tentpole kind of movies, and then you would have regular movies throughout the rest of the year. So... You know, maybe maybe Universal makes one big action thing for the summer, and maybe like Warner Brothers, you know, will have Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings in the in the you know fall winter, and Disney will do their big animated thing in spring, and those are kind of your three big things to look forward to, and then everything else was going to end up, and Fox probably did an action movie in the summer, and then everything else was just normal regular like oh this is a drama oh this is a a more low budget action movie or this is a comedy or whatever like normal movies that we still watch to this day and for some reason everyone decided to go to the all we're going to try to do is tentpole movies no smaller movies and then all the temples start to feel very samey because they're so reliant on cg and trying to get the the cheesy humor that just never quite works because comedy is hard people and you can't just throw in oh i'll make a random quip that's a joke audience will laugh no, that's not quite how that works. you got to be smart with your humor. That's why some of the best humorous people are usually intelligent people. And it was interesting just hearing everyone's point of views because you had a lot of diversity of, of point of view and background going in there talking about things and even arguing with each other a little bit over, you know, oh, but this is good, but yeah, but too much of this isn't good. And it was a really fascinating panel and uh, completely crowded room to the point that I was getting claustrophobic. So... That was great. Uh, you could tell that there was a lot of people, whether they were fans of these people online or they were just that position of like, yes, I'm frustrated with what has happened to cinema. And I'm a little bit of each, I'll be honest. So Yeah, and what I really appreciate about this panel is like the diversity of opinion here, that it wasn't just like you're in a echo chamber because I think when you have like panels like these with um, YouTubers, you, you would assume like, oh no, echo chamber, but actually it was a really good discussion. And I really like hearing all the divergent opinions together. And like, it's one thing to hear, see see all like this discourse going in online. And it's just really refreshing to hear that discourse in person that yes, we can have a healthy conversation about these topics and we need to have more of these conversations in person. I mean, that was my main takeaway from the panel. Mm-hmm. Okay, all right, day two. Um, to end things off, we went to our usual place over at Tom's Watch Bar. Um, this kind of has been a tradition, um, starting with um, last... Um, it's, they actually changed their name from Tom's Urban to Tom's Watch Bar. At least that's, that's what Yelp says. All right, then I'll go for whatever Yelp mm-hmm. says. Um, leaving um, the LA Convention Center, like, oh, wait, there's a Kings game tonight. So there's a lot of Kings fans, like, in the area, and we, we had to wait, like, about like, half an hour to be seated, and there's, like, no place to, like, sit down to, like, wait a bit. And you and I were thinking, like, oh, man, we could, probably could have ditched this, probably could have made, like, a homemade meal or something. Well, but- the big problem was we had to take a gamble on the traffic. Either we had to, like, run into an Uber and get back to and get back to civilization, Or we had to wait it out, and we chose to wait it out. But that also meant every restaurant was packed because people were trying to get their food before going and having to pay stadium prices. And some of us don't like to eat, you know, roach-covered hot dogs. This is true. But overall, like, I think, like, the wait was worth it. Like, we we ended up, like, because the nice thing about, like, us taking an Uber to the convention is, like, we can actually drink. Yeah. None of us has to drive. Like, we can actually have enjoy joy drink or two um, before the night is done. And I think that these were... it after yeah. running around all day. 
him like, well, anyway, hey, we looked the part. We looked really fancy. We even had, like, compliments, like, from Kings fans on our outfits. Yeah. Like, there was, like, a couple, like, just random dudes, like, in Kings jerseys just gets, gave us high fives. And there's one gal that went up. I was like, oh, my God, you are so beautiful. I'm like, oh, thank you. Like, you're very beautiful, too. So, I'm like, it's, it, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. And even, like, um, one of the wait staff recognized what we were dressed up from. Like, yeah, you're from Spike's family. Yeah, we are. Thank you. And I always like going to um, Tom's Watch um, because, like, I like the food. It's comfort food, like, after, after, like, a long day at the convention. Yeah, I got spicy chicken strips. It was mm-hmm. just simple. But that plus a, sometimes a nice you need, drink. And... Sometimes you just need chicken strips at the end of the day. Yeah. And some boozy booze. Yeah. And the spicy flavor was actually really good, so it was, it was nice. So some of the after parties that were going down was um, Tom Kenny. He was hosting something at, I believe, um, the Aztec, which was actually like a Uber ride, ride away from the uh, convention. And he was had like his own big band thing huh. um, playing music. Like, oh, that'd been nice, but like, I, I we kind of need to get up to like get the Uber for the next day. I mean, that would have been something cool to like check out, like as like its own thing like not associated with la comic con like oh by the way tom kenny and his band like hey that, that might be cool like a big band type situation like out of historic like yeah he's not the um, person place. i would normally think of as has a big band mm-hmm. also i was disappointed because i was hearing like um whispers on um instagram like oh there's gonna be a hellfire ball i'm like ooh, hellfire ball like they're actually gonna have a ballroom dance Sadly, uh, it was not a ballroom dance or a fancy dance. It was just a bunch of Marvel cosplayers just dressing fancy, and we weren't invited. Oh, we're never invited to stuff like that. Yeah, never mind. Like, we'll just uh, be uh, cool spies that are awesome and dress fancy Mm -hmm. and have, like, the best drinks. Sorry, Marvel. All right, so um, before we get into the last stage of convention, another word from our sponsors. Um, You can use... So, um... Anytime I record TikTok videos, anytime I do um, solo photo shoots, I use like to use my Light Ring from Multitasky. Multitasky is one of my favorite office supply um, vendors. Um, I I own like their cell phone holders or laptop holders, and like a few other uh, knickknacks that I would need for like my home office. And again, one of my favorite things is the Light Ring that I use for selfies. I use for TikTok videos and so forth. And you can um, use our code Cadillac Cats for 10% off your entire purchase at multitasky.com. Again, use the code Cadillac Cats for 10% off your total purchase. All right, on to day three. So day three, we decided to take an Uber again to the LA Convention Center because, like, you know what? Um, a lot of people are really coming back to conventions. Um, let's just kind of, like, just go ahead and just, uh, just take an Uber. We don't know how, how crowded it was going to be because last year when we drove on day three to the Convention Center wasn't too bad, but getting out was kind of crazy. But then, again, in our defense, we kind of did stay a little bit longer because there was a Nichelle Nichols um, farewell type thing. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that was a uh, that was quite a story. You can watch yeah, our last episode thing. on that. Yeah, that was a thing. And speaking of Michelle Nichols, uh, we got here. We had William Shatner on the main stage, and while you were panel hopping, um, I ended up just kind of listening in on William Shatner's um, adventure through space at the in this panel, and I thought that was really interesting. And he was just talking about like, yeah, um, looking up from t- to the earth from space, like you can feel the nothingness of space. Like, wow, that's pretty deep. Um, Jay, talk about your uh, panel hopping adventures, because you went to, like, the Christmas holiday creepy things. Oh, yeah. I went to a panel that was about the monsters of Christmas and why we like them, and it was interesting. It was, well, sort of. Um, <laughs> it could have been more interesting, but it was a really odd assortment of people running it. So it was, like, some, it was a psychologist, um, like, a person who does, like, Buddhist philosophy stuff, uh, a professor of some sort, and someone else. And the people who were the most interesting were the people who never talked, which is un- rather unfortunate for me. There was one guy who was more or less dominating the whole thing. But it was an interesting exploration of, like, Ebenezer Scrooge and origins of the character and how the character archetype has been used over and over again, why this character speaks to us. And then a discussion about, like, the Grinch, both the animated version and kind of Seuss's original idea, and then the live-action version, which has, obviously, its own uh, take on everything. And, you know, how the Grinch has been kind of part of our lives and what the Grinch represents. And 
and then uh, talk on the Krampus and all the different things the Krampus represents and what he does and is he a villain? Is he a hero? You know, what does he represent for society? It was really a really interesting thing that I felt like the people who had the most important things to say never got a word in edgewise as That's the sad. guy who, stand, who fancies himself a bit of a stand-up comic. He's one of those professors. You know the kind. You've had them. Um, and the loudmouth guy who kept being like, ah, capitalism and uh, ruins Christmas and, and buying stuff and corporate da, 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 da. And I'm like, dude, I don't care about your, your anti-corporate agenda. I want to know about the mythology and the history of these characters. I mean, that's a separate discussion for something else. Like, yeah, we can just go back and forth about, like, the commercialization of the holidays. But, oh, like, yeah. this is more of a... People are here to hear more about mythology and, like, storytelling. And I think that we should just kind of, like, yeah, keep, stay focused, you know? Yeah, stand-up comedy guy reminds me of another teacher I know who gets a little bit like that when he does panels, too. Nothing wrong with that, but when I have someone who wants to talk about stuff from a spiritual perspective and another person who's talking about the childhood trauma that likely led to Ebenezer Scrooge behaving the way he is, I'm much more interested in those topics than I am the other two. Because... We can have the conversation, but for another day, you know? Because it's really interesting thinking about the Grinch and Scrooge as people who probably had some sort of childhood trauma, and in the case of the live-action one, specifically has childhood trauma. <laughs> All right, so for day three, I ended up cosplaying from Twisted Wonderland as Azul. And, oh yeah, that's right, uh, you went as Dick Tracy, yeah. and you went to the G.I. Joe panel. What was that like? That was the first panel I hit. That was great. I love the G.I. Joe panel. It was more like the writers and stuff like that. Normally, I when I go to these, it's either uh, people who do podcasts and fandom side of things, or I get the voice actors who I've got to see multiple times, including some of my favorite characters. I've, I've met their voice actors briefly. This was the writing and, like, and, and art side of it, which was really cool. They had a guy who's been doing uh, artwork for the comics and did, I believe he said he did the cover with the most amount of characters they've ever had on a cover. It won the Guinness Award. Because it's all the, it's like every G.I. Joe character, including Easter eggs, like the Viper from uh, The Viper is Coming. Anyone familiar with that episode from season one of G.I. Joe? The Viper shows up. They talked about making the opening sequence for the show, and more importantly, the opening sequence for the movie. If anyone remembers the animated movie with the, the whole Statue of Liberty and Cobra's attacking it and all that, and... He said the one thing is that you throw you throw the kitchen sink when you do these because you know that because of the budget it's gonna they're gonna cut a bunch of stuff out. So you put as much as you can possibly put in there because you want this to be the most flashy, coolest thing. And if if twenty five percent of what you threw in your uh, storyboards shows up, it's still gonna look pretty cool. Well, he got like seventy five percent of what he threw on his storyboards because they had the movie budget. So when he sees that opening of the Battle of the Statue of Liberty, he's like, oh man, if only the whole show could look like this. And I agree, if only the whole show could look like that, that would be an amazing series. Hearing from the writing perspective of uh, one of the writers there was essentially brought in kind of as a consultant because they had no one who really knew much about the military. And before season one was over, he was a main writer of the staff and then was taking over kind of in season two. Because they, you know, they had, he, as he pointed out, he's like, yeah, they had moments where you would have you know, corporals talking down to lieutenants. And he's like, what? No, that would never happen. And they didn't know how to put the structure together of who should be the leader here based on rank and position. They just kind of threw characters together willy-nilly and who's in charge. I guess we're all in charge. And got that military side of things in there. And <laughs> someone asked him if uh, he had been involved in writing the PSAs. And he said, most of those things were handled out the East Coast. But they did ask a few of us writers, and I said, well, for ideas. And he said, well, I really think that we should do something that's more military. So, you know, maybe Duke could explain to kids how to properly make a Molotov cocktail. <laughs> it's like, after that, they stopped coming to us for suggestions. <laughs> Which, I, I'm like, I would have loved the G.I. Joe PSAs. Kids, those bullies are causing you quite the trouble, aren't they? Well, if you get this bottle here, some gasoline, some hand soap... <laughs> Like, thanks, Duke. Would be a very different PSAs, but it would definitely have filled me with joy as a child. Okay, and while you're just kind of like just walking around, I ended up um, just kind of like just going around Artist Alley and just checking out some of the independent comics. So I said hi to our friends over at Diwata Comics. 
Um, they've been, they've been doing like a couple like uh, Filipino mythology themed um, comics and also Filipino horror. So I always like saying hi to them. And I also not photoed here. There was also another like booth that was also um, indulging in Filipino mythology and um, and comics. And uh, the company is called Quinto um, Comics, and they were promoting the Mask of Halia, which is very interesting because um. They approached me and like, oh yeah, do you know what I think about Philippine mythology? Like, do I? Like, my uh, character in Final Fantasy XIV is named Mayari. Apparently, Halia is the um, alternate name for Mayari. Mayari is the moon goddess in Tagalog mythology. And then we just got had like a got a, got a look got a good talk about Philippine mythology. And I never really have these kind of conversations with people like, oh my god, there's other people who know what Philippine mythology is. Awesome. Well, the one thing I've learned from doing videos is if I do Filipino mythology, I get 10 trillion views. Should just change all my tavern tales to just Filipino stories. Tavern tales. Um, let's pull up and um, have a uh, San Miguel, and we'll talk about the Bakunawa. I still feel annoyed that I didn't have enough time this year to do the, um, the M Megengan or the uh, Pengengan, depending on where you're from. Oh, the McGonagall? Yes, that's oh. not how it's pronounced. <laughs> uh, I do my best. There is, there is a there is, there... Uh, Malaysian version of it. There is a Filipino version of it. I believe I saw like a um, uh, Thai or Vietnamese version of it as well. So I'm like, it's there, there's something about floating heads slash torsos with guts hanging out that attack women that uh, seems to have somehow made its way across Southeast Asia. And I want to talk about it. But the Penangan or the Manangan, Manangal, Manangan, um, and whatever the other name for it was, and I'm like, oh, I didn't get a chance to do this because I got October was busy. <laughs> so all I got out was the Aswang, and I got out um, whatever my other uh, monster was. I can't remember what my other October monster was, but the Aswang video got a lot of, a lot of views. So another thing that I was kind of exploring in the dealers hall. Um, there's a cosplayer here by the name of Alex. Um, day two was cosplaying as um, Geralt from The Witcher, and he was here cosplaying as um, Jiraiya from Naruto, I believe. Those are two very different characters. Yeah, Jiraiya, he's the one with the white hair, right? He is one of the characters with white hair. Kakashi also has white hair. Yeah, I'm just trying to remember, like, my, my Naruto uh, knowledge is just kind of, like, faded. Anywho, um, cosplaying from Naruto, and... He was giving massages at the convention, and it was not like a relaxation massage. It was more like a, kind of like in when you you meet with a chiropractor, they just kind of adjust and readjust and align you again. Mm -hmm. He does that with muscles, and like yeah. I kind of like need, needed this, and like yeah, granted, like, um, you really do feel him like just dig right into your muscles, and it was just something I really needed after just walking around the convention and also just kind of like just being lurched, lunched over to my computer just doing um, office work like yeah I really needed that refresh on my muscles and it was like about like I think it was like around about um, $30 but it, it was definitely wor worth it and I hope this dude comes to conventions I do hope he like gets invited as a guest to conventions because I thought this was a very valuable thing that he was offering. He's like, yeah, I will totally like pay for your services here. Because the only time he can really do this, as he was telling me, is, is if he's invited um, as a guest. So like it makes the whole um, thing worth it because booths at conventions these days are are much more expensive than they were prior to lockdown. Yeah, that's what I've been hearing too. Mm -hmm. But I really liked Alex after that. I'm like, okay, I'll follow you on your socials. And I really hope to see you again at conventions because I will recommend everyone I know your services. Also just walking around day three, here's a random picture of a cat because that's just me. And someone was just telling me, yeah, um, I was like, oh wow, that your cat push looks so realistic. Yeah, I had it custom made to look like my, um, look like my cat who had passed. I'm like, oh cool. And then she thought it was like funny that I was taking a photo of her uh, plush hair. Mm. And so she was she's like, can I get a picture of you taking a picture of my own plush here? I'm like, yeah, sure. I'm a little too meta for my taste. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so day three, they also had um, Hot Topic. Um, they also had their Nightmare Before Christmas, like, set up here for, like, photos. So as you were waiting in line for Hot Topic to get their convention exclusives, um, they had, like, a Nightmare Before Christmas set up here. So as you enter in, you had, like, the um, the trees that had the doors to the different holiday worlds. And even growing up, I was wondering, like, I wonder if there's going to be a Nightmare Before Christmas too, and they jump into, like, some of the other, like, holiday worlds. Because I always wondered, like, what those other holiday worlds would look like. Wasn't they should have done that in the comics, and they never did that either. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you also have, like, the bathtub here that um, Lock, Stock, and Barrel um, right around. Shock. My bad. <laughs> um, and then, like, yeah, I just decided, like, I'll take some Twisted Wonderland photos here. So that was a lot of fun. It works for that. Yeah, I didn't really buy anything from Hot Topic. Like, I just wanted to just take photos here. Well, you're here. doing that. I had some rando come up to me and, like, I cosplay as Dick Tracy, too. I'm like, cool. He's like, let me show you the pictures. No, just please, please don't. No, okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, that's, that's really cool, dude. Yeah, right on, man. And, like... <laughs> Because, I'm like, this is the only character I've ever had that happen with. Like, I've never cosplayed as, like, you know... Hey, I cosplay as G Giyu. Yeah, so do I. Here's my pick. Like, no one has ever done that to me. It's like, oh, yeah, dude, I do, too. I love Giyu. Yeah, he's cool. And then, like, you maybe do a bro little fist bump thing, and then, like, they walk off, and you move on with life, and not have someone talk your ear off about, like, how much they love Dick Tracy, and how's their... Here's their picture when they're at some other event, and here's another one where they're at... I'm like, I, I don't care. Dude, I don't, I don't care, dude. Dude, dude. Guy who's, like, 20 years older than me. I don't care. I was literally introduced to this character in the, with the Warren Beatty movie. Like, I'm not even going to try to pretend to be someone who read the uh, comic strips in the, the newspaper. I, I, I mean, I, I tried... I never read the funnies. I tried read. I tried um, watching the old black and white movies, and I just couldn't get through them. Um, because I remember, like, Mr. Lobo would show those, like, on, like, uh, Cinema Insomnia. And, like, I really tried getting through them, but I just couldn't. They're very... Bland. Bland, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then the the comic books that were usually compilations of stuff or new stories. Those were the other things I got into because of the movie. But the movie is my thing. So for me, like someone who's clearly older than me who probably grew up with the comic strip and all that other stuff, just telling me, my, my brain is like, I, d I don't care, dude. I don't know you. Why are you talking to me? And I don't mean to sound like... I. I am not pretentious cosplayer who's trying to do the whole, oh, how dare you? It's, do you know who I am? I you have plebeians. tens of followers. You plebs. Why are you speaking to yeah. me? I'm more the point of like, okay, dude, because I've never had that experience before. Like, okay, what if I was dressed up like Batman? Would someone have come up to me and go like, dude, I cosplay Batman too. Let me show you my Batman photos. I'm like, I, what? I, sure, dude. Cool. You do you, man. You do you. I think the only Batman I could conceivably pull off is Adam West. At this point, I think I could pull off a pretty decent Adam West Batman, but I don't know what else I could do if I did Batman. All right. Okay, the next panel. So the next panel that um, I was actually curious about because um, one of my buddies is, was actually on this panel, and I wanted to meet him because we kind of became Twitter friends during lockdown. And then I decided to check out the Asian American representation panel. And it had a mix of um, cosplayers, um, writers on comics, and also, like, um, a Jawa actress on um, Star Wars. Which was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them just, just kind of like share their point of view on like just what representation looks like um, in, in Hollywood, in comics, and, and so forth. And like th there was just kind of like just something that was said um, by one of the panelists like, oh yeah, Shatterstar Deadpool too. Like representation, like Shatterstar only had like two minutes and then died and got jobbed horribly. And he was kind of a jerk. Like, even make, when he died, it's like, well, that guy was kind of a jerk anyways. Like, mm -hmm. they just kind of, like, laugh it off. And I'm like, well, one, I love Shatterstar. Although he also called himself Rusty, who is a completely different character from X-Force. So I have no idea what they were doing with that. Yeah, so I just kind of, like, just wrote, uh, just saw Shatterstar as more like a one-off character. Because when I think of representation, I just think of, like, well-rounded characters and just kind of, like... Um, like, for example, like, everything, um, everything all at once. Just kind of something like that or, like... I don't know. When I think about representation, it's not like, okay, we're just going to put this guy here for, like, about a couple of minutes and then just, like, okay, off with his head. <laughs> like, nah, I don't really think think about that. But I just think, of like, just, again, just more well-rounded characters, characters that, like, who are um, very clearly um, who they are and characters that, like, also folks can relate to as well. But that's just kind of, like, when I think about it. But otherwise, um, each panelist had, like, just something insightful to say. Like, um, I'm just trying to recall. You probably recall this better than I do. But the gentleman in the middle was talking about, it was, like, was it, like, he was working with um, 
which comic was he working on? They told her, like, yeah, like, TNA is great, but... Um, it was one of the things from Stan Lee's company. Mm-hmm. I don't remember which comic specifically. I, I do know he said the title. I don't remember off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. Where essentially he was trying to, like, do a bunch of creative things and to make the action look natural and real, and the person was more concerned on how sexy the women look. And he just got frustrated and had to quit the job because they didn't care, you know, about anything else. They just had this one specific thing that mattered to them. So any kind of, you know, proper representation, martial arts looking right, the structure of the comic didn't matter as long as the women were sexy. That's what we're selling this on. And it was a frustration for him, especially when he wanted to draw some of the Asian women to look more authentically Asian. Um, And that's not what they wanted. (laughs) wrong time for people to be blowing up your phone yeah right um but yeah i thought that was a very insightful panel i got to talk to like um the rogue cosplayer at the end of it got to finally get selfie with a friend of mine here um he's a gentleman at the very end um i wanted to talk to leilani because like oh yeah i didn't know you grew up in santa paula and like your mm. parents like own like the one chinese restaurant there because i'm always <laughs> i like that story i actually have friends up th- i actually have like family up there i was like i actually i'm actually kind of curious um i know leilani she shows up to like a lot of the um frankincense type events so like if i ever have downtime I'd, I'd love to meet her and just uh chit chat with her because I think she has, like, a lot of um, great behind-the-scenes stories. And, like, just hearing her just talking about, like, what it was like to play a Jawa. Um, and messing, I was, messing around on set. Yeah, because I always thought, like, Jawas were, like, played by children. I guess they were, like, in the original in 77. But this uh, Leilani, I think, believe she, she was, like, in the more recent um, Star Wars um, series of stuff. Yeah, I think they didn't bring in little people to play the shorter characters probably until Jedi, I'd imagine. Because mm-hmm. I know a lot, most of, most if not all, the uh, Ewoks are little people. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure what they did for the Ugnaughts in uh, Empire. And I, yeah, I think the Jawas were literally children that they had available wherever they were at. Mm. I think. Um, someone who knows the behind the scenes of the original. Because they're not even around. They're there for like one scene. And then I think you might see one or two in the background at Moss Eisley. So they could have been little people. I'm not certain on that one. But they did get a little person to play R2-D2. So it would stand- Kitty Baker. Yeah, so it could stand that they got a couple others. I just don't know how many were available as actors in Europe and North Africa at the time. Yeah, panels like this I'd like to, like, be a part of and, like, lend my insight to because I thought about running panels like this, but I just don't want to be, like, the one person to, like, just be on the panel. Like, I could roll this solo, but for a panel like this, you need, like, a variety of different voices and even some voices that might um, disagree with each other. So I really would like to be part of something like this There's because I feel like I have like a lot to say um, given um, my experience in being in fandom for the past like 20 years or so. I, I think there'd be a way to recruit people or to get people, you know, interested in a lead up to a con. I, th- I think there's a way to do that. It's, it's going to be a lot of work, but I think yeah. it's doable and I think the results can be really interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, as this is just making me think, I totally want a little person's actor panel. Oh, that'd be cool. I want, I want to hear their stories. I want to hear about all the crazy stuff they've had to dress up as. Because, you know, there's a whole bunch of, like, weird little, like, garbage tier kids movies where they just had to have a little person dress up as, like, an alien or a, a oh, yeah. little Bigfoot or Getting something. Getting behind the scenes stories, like, from those B movies would be a, a really amazing. And I'm like... I love hearing behind so the scenes stories. So put that together. <laughs> I would love to hear these people's stories and all the crazy weird stuff they've had to do. Yeah, I think my one critique of this panel was, like, again, just kind of like this hearkening back to just some of the previous panels is like the idea that marvel is like the be all end all of of pop culture because i'm like there's so much more media outside of marvel that people vibe with more like okay yeah like i had a dream last night that i was scarlet witch and that was pretty awesome but i feel like there's just so more to entertainment than just marvel and we shouldn't be relying on marvel to make the, uh, creative decisions and to be represented in media when there's so much more out there. Like, again, I was just perusing through the dealer's hall and there was already, like, two Filipino publishers um, that were creating, like, comics based around Filipino mythology. There was a lot of indie stuff at this con, which is the one thing I will say for, since year one, this event has been really good towards indie comic people. There's a lot of them at the con. If you're into indie comics or want to get into an indie comic, like the stuff you know we were just talking about or what have you, there's so much there. It's kind of crazy. 
And again, um, if anyone is planning to run a panel like this, hi, I have a lot of insight to give. I'm the person who gives out the ribbon Mabuhai bitches at anime conventions. That's the person I am. And yeah, um, any hoot. Next up, slide. And yeah, here's just me with the uh, panelists after um, we just had a good chit chat with them as we were winding down the con to, again, go into dealer's hall to do some Christmas shopping. But before that, we also had the Disney gathering. It was small, and I'll get more into this in the constructive criticism section of LA Comic Con, but this was our, um, our very humble Disney cosplay meetup. Um, the reason why it was smaller than usual is only Comic-Con decided to have to host their own independent, quote-unquote, official Disney cosplayers meetup, and they had made the announcement a week before the convention. More cosplayers gravitated to this one versus the one that our buddy Robert, this is one of his photos here of the um, Humble Gathering. Uh, Robert has always historically hosted the Disney Gathering Sunday uh, 2 o'clock. And that was the one I was going to support. So this is the one that's always been here. This is the one that has always been like homegrown. I'm going to support Robert's um, D Disney meetup here. The one thing I'll say is I'm never against a convention organizing when and where the cosplay gatherings will be. But the problem is it felt like this one was kind of, as you said, like two weeks before the con, a little rushed and not really handled properly, especially from some of the stuff. Or they could have reached Robert out to like us. Robert and like, hey, like, can we also promote your meetup? Can we add that to our programming? Because a lot of conventions, especially anime conventions, they do work with all the fan organization of um, costly meetups. Even a Anime Expo does that. Like, as problematic as a lot of where the gathering sites were for Anime Expo this year, at least they work with the community. Mm hmm. So, I don't know. It seemed like they were taking a step that direction. It just felt like it wasn't quite done right. And they probably need, you know, a cosplay coordinator person as part of the staff in order to make sure this all works. And if that person can find the, you know, spurt and photographers and other, like, I guess community leaders, for lack of a better word, who can help organize stuff on the, you know, the secondary level, essentially lieutenants to their captain, that would really work out pretty well, I think. All right, day three. Again, we were just doing just our Christmas shopping. Uh, we'd like to share you what kind of gifts we got, but we don't want to spoil it for those. Well, will they be listening to this? Probably not. Um, gift ideas that we had at LA Comic Con that probably could be on your gift list next year, next time you're shopping at LA Comic Con. Um, candles. Um, Asian Boba Girl had a variety of different candles. Um, and also you had um, cantrip candles, which have a lot of fantasy themed um, candle candles over there. Plus those guys are fun to talk to. Mm -hmm. And they also convinced us like, yeah, you guys got to do the Stranger Things um, thing. Well, we we were are we're going to we, we we're actually going to going to do it today. But um, things happen after the con beyond our control that we had to delay it. <laughs> and also, yeah, like just finding like um, certain figures that friends of ours, family of ours, that would um, cherish and appreciate were also just part of the gifts that we picked up. And also unique tote bags, because like a lot of booths are selling like unique um, tote bags that we wanted to also just get for friends and families, um, because it makes them um, wrapping easier. And also like, hey, it's a tote bag and tote bags are practical gifts. It's not like uh, a bunch of pairs of socks that were only holiday themed socks. We can only wear like 25 days during the year um but yeah i always believe that giving the gift of practical gifts that the gifts that you can use like 365 days during the year is always amazing mm -hmm. so yeah that was the last day and we ended up um taking an uber back to um where we needed to go and we had a tasty dinner and boy oh boy just having dinner at koku ichibanya you and i were like on that rice like goku and dragon ball oh yeah it was just <laughs> like i was like on twitter i posted like okay this is a reenactment of us at koku ichibanya post la comic-con and it's just a gif of goku just chowing down on rice yeah all right constructive criticism well, first of all, I really hope that next year LA Comic Con has like a coordinator that works with the community to like better organize costly meetups and gatherings. This has 
some this was something that has been going on in the anime world since like the the um the 2000s the o's because i know you also have like a hand in that too with anime vegas Mm -hmm. only one year it's exhausting Mm -hmm. and you need to have someone full-time on staff to coordinate like costly meetups and gatherings and like when you have like so many like folks like having like okay historically for for example the disney gathering has been going on since has been going on for a while sunday at two o'clock so why not coordinate with robert to like hey like we want to like put you guys on schedule is there any support that we can give you on um, blah 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 um, we can have our official la comic-con photographers also document this as well because i felt bad for robert because um he was the only photographer that was taking photos of the disney gathering and that just like oh man and like normally I would also be taking photos too, but I was like in almost all the group shots. <laughs> so, um, but I, th- that was just my main, my major constructive criticism um, for the convention. Um, not the fault of the convention, but I was also very disappointed that the Hellfire Ball was not like a ballroom dance they had. It was still like, oh, it's just like fancy cosplayers and, and stuff that were having like their own things. Like, ah, oh, dang, I want like, Ballroom dance would be nice and theme to Hellfire would be nice, but it's okay. Marvel doesn't love me. Everyone wants to wear clothing out of the 1700s. Marvel doesn't Slash love women me. women in lingerie? Yeah, that sounds freaking great. Yeah, I, I think I'll just uh, stay on the Spy X family side. Like, Craig, um, um, how's your ball doing? <laughs> Any hoot. Um, Jay, do you have any constructive criticism for LA Comic Con? One thing they need to bring back is a proper tabletop room. And not yes. a tabletop room where I can also hear everyone's playing video games and a bunch of cosplayers doing photo. No, a legit quiet room where maybe at like one end of the room you get people with their indie games and then you have tables for free play and then you have the tables that are set for this is going to be Adventures League or this is going to be someone of the convention staff who's going to run a pickup game of Call of Cthulhu or uh, Werewolf or... Uh, um, munchkin or whatever like you need to bring this back because a it helps to have just a quiet room in general that even if you're not going to play a game if you're just going to sit there at a table and game on your cell phone because you just need to not people for 20 minutes a room like that's nice but if i can then if i meet someone i go oh wow your indie card game or your indie you know d20 game is really cool it's like oh well at three o'clock table right over there uh, if you want to play, we'll, we'll do a game and I'll teach you all the rules and it'll be a lot of fun. And you go, yeah, you know what? I'll be back here at three. That sounds cool. Like we need that room. We, we need that area. I, something post pandemic has killed tabletop rooms and the tabletop rooms in quotations we get now are just jam packed next to noise. And I don't know anyone who's played D and D before, but playing D and D with a lot of noise is not fun. It is very frustrating and annoying. Certain card games you can play with a lot of noise because they don't require discussion. But there's a lot of games that if they if you have all that noise, it's just going to drive you crazy. You guys had it before. You can bring it back again. And I think the indie game, uh, card game, you know, and, and tabletop people would pre- appreciate it. Those of us who want to play D&D or Battletech or whatever would appreciate it. And people who just want to do a pickup game of MTG would appreciate it. All right, so that's our constructive criticism for LA Comic Con. All right, and we have another advert here. And this time you're gonna promote yourself because, hey, okay, guess what? You're a guest at Anime Los Angeles. Oh, that's true. Woo! To quote the famous wrestler man. Speaking of wrestling, you're also part of Cosplay Wrestling Federation who made it all possible for you to be a guest. Yeah, I'm part of the Cosplay Wrestling Federation. We are a, Audience participation comedy show designed in the style of a wrestling show with uh, promos being used to hype the crowd up or piss the crowd off if you're a heel or a face and eventually ending in a verbal smackdown between the champion and the crowd favorite or the crowd's least favorite because heels have made it to the champion round many, many times. I will be there as totally not a spy Lloyd Forger, who is super not a spy and going to use his spy gadgets and family to take down the other opponents, because that's not what I do, because that's what a spy would do, and I am most certainly not a spy. And he's totally not going to be wearing a brand new outfit. 
So anyway, um, ALA, though, that's happening in three weeks. We hope to see you there. And we hope to see you at Cosley Wrestling Federation. Cosley Wrestling Federation will be happening Saturday afternoon at the Seaside Ballroom, which is right across from Tabletop Gaming. Which I'm sure everyone will appreciate all the yelling and chanting while trying to play Tabletop. All right. Final thoughts on Comic Con LA, LA Comic Con, San Luis Comic Con, et cetera, and so it's, forth. It's just Los Angeles Comic Con now. Um, I think it was pretty good this year, I'll be honest. I liked it better than previous <coughs> years because previous years I was like, eh, it's all right. I'm like, uh, let's see how we feel like. Because, like, going into LA Comic Con, like, for example, last year, our motivation to go to LA Comic Con last year was like, oh, Cobra Kai's going to be here. Oh, God. And, and then, then Cobra Kai, Kai there. ditch at the yeah. uh, That would make me sad. But thankfully, they announced it multiple times. Oh, wait, no, they didn't. They announced it once, and no one heard them. And then they just let everyone wait. And then for for uh, 2022, like, okay, it's three weeks before LA Comic Con. Do you still want to go? Like, I guess we got nothing better to do. Like, okay, let's just look fancy at Spy X family characters. I'll be like... honest here. I went specifically to meet up with Chris Gore. I want to just meet him again and have a little bit more of a conversation than our three seconds in a hallway at a uh, year uh, before yeah whatever con it was at it was on la comic con um 2021 yes where he finished a panel and it's like oh, i gotta go to a thing cool it was really nice meeting you sir <laughs> and I did you to... fulfill your objective this i did year? i did i got to talk to him a lot about a couple different things and he, he inspired me to continue working on what i'm working on and day three i went because i enjoyed day two so much and by the way, there's a lot of things we didn't even talk about. The fact that they had a wrestling ring there with the women of wrestling. They had a whole booth there of some of the glow ladies who are always wonderful. So there's a whole wrestling side of things we didn't even cover in the course of this discussion. And I think getting back to the those early years where we got, oh, the wrestling's over here and the indie comics are over here and um, other pop culture stuff is over here and anime stuff is here. And having just a little bit of everything, having a smorgasbord of fandoms is really what this con should do, and I really hope they stick with it because that's what made this so enjoyable for me this year. And again, I really like how there's a variety of different fandoms represented here, and I really like just exploring the dealer's hall. I mean, LA Comic Con, regardless, it's going to be our Christmas shopping con, and there's nothing more unique and says a thought that counts when you're shopping and supporting indie artists and folks who are just trying to make a living based off fandom in an age where AI art is starting to take over and people don't care what they use AI art to steal um, other people's artwork. Um, I'm a huge proponent of supporting indie artists, um, indie vendors, and sharing that love with the people you love. And I'm glad that we were able to find like a lot of unique things for our friends and family at this convention because there's always something different. And I like the dealer's hall because it's not just Funko Pops. It's just all these different things. Like you can get like lounge live backpacks um, that are unique and different. Um, you can get like, again, candles, um, figures. They even had like, um, I forgot the author's name. You probably know it better than I do. Um, the author for Tarzan and John Carter of Mars. Oh, uh, Robert E. Howard. Yeah, they had Wait. a whole booth Shoot. based on that. And I wanted, I, I regret not picking up one of the books because, like, we thought the dealer's hall was going to be open a little bit later on Sunday, but it turns out it closed a little bit earlier than I mentally had estimated it That's to be. A bunch of John Carter stuff. And we were just happy to see, like, John Carter stuff. I was happy to see Princess of Mars stuff. And, like, oh, hey, and we had a good, good conversation with the vendor, too. It's like, and again, it's we only did West. the first Isekai. We Although went, think we went to the first, we only went to West Hall for like just some, for just Saturday. I wanted to explore more of West Hall, but I think I got the gist of it, like just on, on, on the, on day two for the couple hours, for like the one hour that we were there. But you know, like I just always like just look, like looking around and looking at stuff there. And I think you can use the um, meeting rooms above West Hall to have like a tabletop room. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think those rooms are being used this year. Because I know last year they were using that for, like, the Star Trek convention within the convention. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. That's where that area was. Yes, that area could be used for a lot of stuff. I don't know what they were doing with this. I area. don't know what they were doing it for. I know there weren't panels on that side because they were mainly using the 300 and the 400 um, rooms for yeah, panels. Yeah, which makes sense to keep all the panels kind of close to each other. Yeah. Instead of certain cons I could name that put all their panels on opposite sides of the building because they want to drive me insane. Scream. But any hoot, um, our next conventions, um, 
will be um, Anime Los Angeles, um, WonderCon, and Anime Boston. Those are our next three conventions coming up around the horizon. Um, Anime Los Angeles will be hosting the um, How to Shop for Fabric in the LA Fabric District panel. Um, we'll be also hosting Gunpla and Make Mine Mecca with our colleague Rams, and we're looking forward to like, yay, it's going to be more than just the two of us running panels. We'll be together again. I might have to do a giveaway. I might, I might do that. Well, we do have like a lot we of these a pile uh, of, like, stuff I need to sort Gundam through. gifts here yeah. from like the Gundam um, VIP party. Yeah, I need to sort through that and see what like I'm willing to give away. Mm hmm. Any hoots? So, any other um, final thoughts on LA Comic Con before we wrap up? Um, I'm just hoping they keep it up, and you know, if they can do some minor improvements next year, it could be a really great con, and you know, we'll make our decision if we're going to go next year, three weeks before the con. It's only a tradition. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for tuning in to another edition of Convention Tea. This has been Dame Scarlet Asbel and Jared the Greek. And we will see you at the con. And remember, you can also um, support us on our Ko-Fi if you like our show. Visit our website because it has a huge archive of convention reports since the early 2000s. So if you're curious, again, what Anime Expo was like in 2003 at the Anaheim Convention Center, we got you covered. <laughs>